Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, oh, <laughs> this video uh, took a little while to put together. It was a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. It was uh, really easy in my mind, but that wasn't the reality of it. So I just wanted to contemplate and explore the idea of if uh, the Lord chose Christmas or winter solstice to be the time of his second coming. Um, I had this idea just because of interactions with a lot of you. A lot of people have said that this Christmas feels really special and more than once people have uh, put in the comments, you know, could he come on Christmas? And uh, at first I kind of like reject that idea. But then as I started to kind of think about it, I, th I saw how that might actually be a perfect time for him to come. And I'm going to show you why. Uh, and it, it, Gosh, it, it's really interesting, actually. So I know I know that people's some people's heads are going to explode because it's speculation. So if you're the anti speculation type, just don't watch the video. OK, we're going to consider this possibility. And I know that some people aren't c comfortable with considering possibilities. Um, no one needs to act off of this information. We'll just wait and see what actually happens. But it's OK to think about things. And so we're going to think about this. OK, so let's start off with uh this okay why is christmas celebrated on december 25th now most of you probably already know but just as a recap there are two theories and we're just going to focus on theory number one this is on livescience.com it's unclear exactly when and why some christians started celebrating jesus birth on december 25th Ancient records indicate that a feast dedicated to Sol Invictus, a sun god, uh, was held in the Roman Empire on December 25th, raising the possibility that Christmas replaced it. We all know that the Roman Empire uh, eventually adopted Christianity as uh, the official religion of the empire, right? And... Um, that's why you you have the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and you know Italy is the where the Catholic Church is, and the you know the Vatican. So Rome and Christianity makes sense. Uh, there was also a pagan festival called Saturnalia in mid in mid December that occur occurred over several days. However, there are some problems with this so called history of religion theory. Christians may have been celebrating Jesus' birth on December 21st before the Sol Invictus Feast was created. Paul Bradshaw, a professor emeritus of theology at the University of Notre Dame, wrote in an article published in the book, The Oxford Handbook of Christmas. Noth Nothaft agreed, quote, A lot hinges on when December 25th, or the 25th of December became the occasion of a Roman feast associated with Sol Invictus. He said in the email, most uh, scholars would probably agree that this is unlikely to be earlier than uh, 274 AD, the year when Emperor Aurelian dedicated a new temple of Sol Invictus, Sol Invictus in Rome. We know too little about this feast to make confident pronouncements, uh, Nothaft added. There's also the question of whether the feast was significant enough for early Christians to place Jesus' birthday on that day. December 25th is also, quote, the date on which the Northern Hemisphere observes, observers are first able to detect the northward movement of the sun. Okay, now this is where th things start to get kind of interesting. Okay, so in other words... The solstice is uh, usually on the twenty first of December. Uh, the twenty first of December, it can be on the twenty second in some years. But even though that's when the solstice takes place, it's not until a few days later on the twenty fifth, according to this, that observers are able to detect the northward movement of the sun. So 
In other words, that's when they're able to tell that the days are starting to get longer, that they can see the sun moving north in the northern hemisphere. And we're going to get into that. Don't worry. I think because this is kind of like the crux of this idea that maybe uh, the Lord would choose this day for his second coming for symbolic reasons. Okay. Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. Uh, the detection of this movement may explain why the festival was held on this date. Alan noted. Let's look at what um, winter solstice is. Oh, and by the way, actually, before we move on to that, one interesting thing to note is that um, essentially you had the Roman Empire, which was the fourth beast in uh, the vision of Daniel of the four beasts, right? And then King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the Roman Empire was the legs of the statue. This is the this is the beast. This is the empire that assisted um, in killing Christ. You know, crucifying him. So there there's a pretty strong connection between uh, Christ and the Roman Empire. Uh, and so, one interesting thing that I pointed out before on this channel, and don't worry, this all ties in. Okay, the church symbol. This is a this is an article uh, called the new church. It should say symbol. It's not supposed to be called a logo. The new church symbol: uh, design a designer's pers perspective and analysis by Brian Collier. You'll notice that uh, it has the previous church. Um, basically, I don't know what you would call the the old symbol. I don't know. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that's in the block uh, below Christ. It, this block is supposed to represent the cornerstone, uh, that he's the chief cornerstone, right, of the church. So there's something interesting about the font or the typeface. I want to show you something here. It has to do with Rome. Okay, the font, typography. Finally, we've arrived at the font, the best part, in my opinion, or at least my favorite part. When I was studying graphic design at BYU, I had the privilege of learning from Adrian Pulfer. He helped direct the church's logo change that happened in 1995. Uh, some of you may have been members of the church at the time or old enough to remember this used to be <clears throat> excuse me, this used to be what it looked like. And I swear I've seen in recent times uh, this still on church buildings, like it hasn't been replaced yet. Um, like, I feel like I've seen this since 1995 on many different ward buildings. Anyway, it changed from this to this, right? And it made it so that the central focus, the biggest part of it would be Jesus Christ, right? That That's the most important part of the name of the church. And the change was necessary. The old logo did not translate well into other languages, and uh, we are a worldwide church. The new logo fixed that. And here you can see the different languages where just easily you put Jesus Christ right in the middle. Um, and it just, it all works very well. My, prefer my professor Adrian <clears throat> shared the following with our class about the creation of the logo update. He told us that he proposed that the church commission a professional typographer to create a, propri a proprietary typeface. Okay. If you didn't know, lo uh, fonts are subject to copyright. Um, so you want to be aware of that when, whenever you're designing. You can't just because it's like words, it, the font itself is copyrighted. So he's saying here he's he recommended for the church to create its own copyrighted font typeface. They agreed, and they commissioned none other than John Hofler, or Heffler, I don't know. If you don't know who he is, and I assume you don't, he's a very well, he is very well known for his font work. For example, he was commissioned by GQ to design their proprietary typeface, now released to the public under the name Gotham. You will find 
uh, you will find used in the Obama logo and campaign from 2008, the SNL logo, and of course, the GQ logo. He was also commissioned by Martha Stewart to design a proprietary typeface for her magazine, now released for public purchase under the name Archer. I'm going to say it's Heffler. Heffler was hired and proposed a design, which he called Deseret, based on his own research, with modifications to the font. It was released for public purchase under the name Requiem. Here's a little look into the the inspiration for the Deseret typeface used in the church logo. A lot of inspiration came from the Trajan typeface. Here's a comparison. So here you go, da -da, Trajan versus Requiem. Now look at this. Now this is interesting. The Trajan font was originally inspired by this column in Rome. Quote, it is a triumphal column in Rome, Italy, that commemorates Roman Empire, Emperor Trajan's victory in the Dacian Wars. So this column right here, a symbol of victory. Here's a close-up of the text engraved at the base of the column. Look at the R. It's very similar to what you, what you see in the church logo. All right, see, there's the R right there. And then he says, isn't, this, isn't that fitting? The font that the official name of Jesus Christ is set in is derived from the Roman Empire that crucified him. And it's no accident that the victory in war column, uh, sorry, that the victory in war column it's derived from symbolizes the victory Christ has in the war against evil. So it's like, um, how when Christ comes, he's going to assume the political kingdom of this world, right? Right now, those that are in charge are mostly the, the descended countries from Rome, right? The ten horns, the ten toes. And so the transfer of power is going to go from these remnants of the Roman Empire, the same empire that crucified Christ, uh, to Christ himself. And so, yeah, it's very fitting that you would have this, uh, you would have this typeface that's derived from that. It's like Christ taking over. And so when we think about Sol Invictus and we think about the Roman, uh, the Romans and how they celebrated the, the solstice, that's also very fitting if he chose to came to come on, uh, the winter solstice. Okay, so let's move on. Winter Solstice 2022, the first day of winter. The Winter Solstice happens on Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. This is the astronomical first day of winter in the Northern Hemisphere and the shortest day of the year. What happens at the Winter Solstice? Why is the, is the Solstice important? Okay, so... It's the day with the fewest hours of sunlight in the whole year. Keep that in mind. This is important symbolically, I think. The day with the fewest hours of sunlight. The winter solstice marks the official beginning of astronomical winter, as opposed to meteorolo meteorological, meteorological winter, which starts about three weeks prior to the solstice. The winter solstice occurs once a year in each hemisphere, once in the northern hemisphere in December and once in the southern hemisphere in June. It marks the start of each hemisphere's winter season. We often think of, of the winter solstice as, as an event that spans an entire calendar day, but the solstice actually lasts only a moment, specifically uh, its exact moment when the hemisphere is tilted as far away from the sun as it can be. This is shown in the diagram below. Okay, so let's look at this symbolically. Symbolically. So the day that has the fewest hours of sunlight and um, is tilted as far away from the sun as it can be. So think about this. What does the sun represent to us in our church? The sun is a symbol of the celestial kingdom. 
It's a symbol of God's presence, right? And so if you have a day or a moment during the year where you're the farthest away from the, from the sun, well, um, symbolically, that's probably kind of not a good day, right? To be as far away from the sun as you possibly can be. And let's think about that as we read from uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation. I want to read uh, from volume one, and I think it's volume three. And this is talking about the second coming and when the second coming is going to happen. Warning to the wicked. We all know that the world is in distress because of wickedness. People in every land reject the gospel and the judgments of the Lord have been poured out upon them. These judgments are continuing and will continue if the people will not repent. Uh, the Lord has said that he will come to set things in order when the cup of iniquity is full. So there's that. And then he says something similar in volume three. Christ will come in a day of wickedness. When we become ripe in iniquity, then the Lord will come. I get annoyed sometimes at some of our elders who, when speaking, say the Lord will come when we all become righteous enough to receive him. The Lord is not going to wait for us to get righteous. When he gets ready to come, he's going to come. When the cup of iniquity is full. And if we are not righteous then, it will just be too bad for us. For we will be classed among the ungodly, and we will be as stubble to be swept off the earth, the face of the earth. For the Lord says, Wick wickedness shall not stand. Do not think the Lord delays his coming, for he will come at the appointed time. Not the time which I have heard some preach, when the earth becomes righteous enough to receive him. I have heard some men in positions and places of trust in the church preach this. Men who are supposed to be acquainted with the word of the, of the Lord but they failed to comprehend the scriptures. Christ will come in a day of wickedness when the earth is ripe in iniquity and prepared for the cleansing. And as the cleanser and purifier, he will come and all the wicked will be as stubble and will be consumed. Okay. So when the cup of iniquity is full. So if you're looking at the year in these terms, uh, I guess you could say the most wicked day of the, the year, the time when you're the furthest away from the sun and you have the fewest hours of sunlight, would be winter solstice. Winter solstice. Okay. There were a few more things, I think, here. Uh, the sun's path is as low in the sky as it can get, even at high noon. Okay. Um, now, this is interesting here. The day after winter solstice, the sun's path begins to advance northward again. Okay. That's going to be important for the next part of the video um, after I read a few quotes. Um, well, I'm trying to think the best way to do this. Sorry, this, this has been hard to plan in my mind. <laughs> Uh, okay, look at it like this. Let's look at the Jewish feast days. We know that these are significant. Uh, these were observed uh, back in Old Testament times. Okay, They were on a lunar calendar, and they were to observe these feast days. Seven of them, essentially. In the spring, you had uh, the Feast of Passover, or in other words, the Passover Seder, which is eaten on the first day of Passover, which begins at sundown. That's when you would eat the Passover Seder. Okay. And then the entire week of Pesach uh, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the second day of Pesach is <clears throat> Bikurim, the Feast of First Fruits. Um, we know that these have been fulfilled. They were supposed to point forward to Christ. And so that's why the Lord had them observe these, these feasts. It, it was meant to point their mind to Christ that would come in the future. Um, so obviously the Passover, Pesach, the Passover Seder, that's symbolic of Christ himself, uh, the, the atonement 
right? Uh, his sacrifice. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, unleavened Bread is not risen, right? So obviously it's pointing their mind to when he would be, when he would rise and the Feast of First Fruits would be him being the first to rise, the first uh, that would, of, of our generation of Heavenly Father's children, he is the first that would return back into God's presence and pave the way for the rest of us to be able to do the same. So he was the first fruits, uh, the first fruits offered in the temple, right? And then uh, I'm not going to go through all these in, in depth, but you, so you have the spring feast. Uh, it also includes the Feast of Weeks, also known the Feast of the Harvest, okay? Also known as Shavuot, Pentecost. Those are These are all names for the same thing. Uh, that's the last of the feast or the spring feasts. And then you have the three fall feasts. Now, you you know from reading the scriptures, even if you're not you have no awareness of these feasts, you know that there's a lot of harvesting uh, symbolism and metaphors in the scriptures. Well, it all has to do with this, and this all has to do with our mortal experience that we're going through. That essentially what is happening is our Heavenly Father is essentially uh, a farmer, right? And we are the crop. We are the different species of crop, you know, pomegranates, wheat, da 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 da. Uh, there, you can go into that in depth. But essentially, we're, what he's trying to do is he's putting us through this mortal experience, and those that come out the right way. Uh, are the ones that are going to be harvested, the ones that accept Christ, the ones that uh, go through all the ordinances, the saving ordinances of the gospel. When you do that, uh, you are a good fruit to be eaten, right? To be consumed, to be essentially become uh, part of the family of God, meaning, you know, we're all God's children, but those that become sealed uh, to family and ultimately to Christ, that is the future, you know, celestial family that's moving forward. Th those are the ones that are being harvested. And so, uh, anyone that knows anything, <clears throat> if you're if you're alive and breathing, you know that uh, it's in the spring that you start planting crops, and you can do it like it depends on the crop. You can do it throughout the year, but. Uh, it starts the very soonest that you can do it is in spring. Uh, typically, after the last the last uh, freeze date is when you do it. Um, and then through the year you grow and da da da. And then there's uh, harvests throughout the year. And the last harvest, based on these feasts, the last harvest is commemorated or goes along with the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. That, can, that essentially commemorates the end of the harvest season. The final harvest. Okay, the last harvesting. So, hopefully you can see where I'm going here. Um, now, winter solstice and Christmas come well after that. It comes at the, at the very... It comes at the very end. Okay? There, there's no more harvesting going on uh, at that point unless you're like doing cotton or something like that but that's not you that's not what we're talking about um so it's definitely like the end of the harvest like the final final end even though it's not commemorated with a feast day solstice would be the end as far as like this cycle of uh harvesting and crops and so on and so forth you have a year from beginning to end and solstice would be the very end right so you can see that it might be a very fitting day for christ to come where everything has been finalized and we're moving into a new cycle um now okay so okay so let's move on uh let's talk a little bit about we know that christ came here in the beginning uh, like if you were to, he, the year when he was born, <clears throat> he was born, uh, during this season, during the spring. Okay. How do we know that? Okay. Now let's get to the quotes that I was talking about. So I have a few to read to you. This one is, um, president Harold B. Lee. 
strengthen the stakes of Zion. He says, this is the annual conference of the church. April 6th, 1973 is a particularly significant date because it commemorates not only the anniversary of the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in this dispensation, but also the anniversary of the birth of the Savior, our Lord, and Master Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith wrote this preceding this preceding a revelation given on that same date. This is from DNC 20, verse 1. The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh, it being regularly regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country by the will and commandments of God in the fourth month and on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. But there's more. Okay. <clears throat> this This is a solid concept in, in our church. I've seen debate about this. Um, I was even kind of unsure about it at the beginning of my channel because I had never really looked into it, but no, this is solid. Now we're looking at uh, Elder Richard G. Scott. He was an apostle. Name of this talk, Jesus Christ, Our Redeemer, April 1997 General Conference. It is April 6th. Modern scripture records that Jesus Christ was born on this day. And then the footnote takes you to DNC 20, verse 1. Okay, next. Now this one, this is interesting. This is Gordon B. Hinckley. This is also in 1997, interestingly. Uh, I don't know if they, they just like were talking about this that year, the fact that he was born on April 6th. But this is what Gordon B. Hinckley says at uh, the first presidency Christmas devotional for that year. Okay, He says, It is the season of the winter solstice. In a few days comes the promise that spring will come again and summer will return, as it has through all the millennia that men have been upon the earth. It is no wonder that in ancient times, Christmas, commemorating the birth of the Christ child, was celebrated at this solstice season, President Hinckley remarked. Continuing, uh, men had no knowledge of the time of his birth, and so they came to bond the celebration of Christmas with the celebration of the return of the sun. See, isn't that right there fitting for the second coming? So Christians, you know, they're like, okay, let's do it on this day. But with us, in contemplating the second coming, isn't it fitting that he would come on a day that promises the return of the sun? It's perfect. And then President Hinckley continues, uh, while, we know, while we now know through Revelation, the time of the Savior's birth, we observed the 20, we observed the 25th of December, with the Christian with the Christian world, okay. So he he's here saying yes. We we already we know when he was actually born, okay. Just like we read before, it was it's in DNC twenty verse one, uh, but still we observe it with the rest of the Christian world, and that's appropriate. It's appropriate. That's why, you know, we don't go to church in Old Testament clothing. That's why we don't grow beards. We we fit in with the world. We don't. Uh, partake of the world and its wickedness, but you have to be, if, if you're trying to save the souls of men and you're trying to um, do the most good, you have to like meet halfway. And, and, and that's why, you know, we have our church buildings resemble the rest of Christianity. Um, <clears throat> we share a lot of the same hymns. Um, it's not necessary to be completely different from them and something that they wouldn't be familiar with if that makes sense. So this is another one of those things where you could get really rigid and there's people that tend to want to do this where it's like, no, we should observe Christmas on April 6th and be separate. But no, it, that's just the, the complete black and white thinking. And that's not the way of Christ. The way of Christ, it is black and white when it comes to sin and righteousness, but not when it comes to things like this that aren't commandments. So, okay, next uh, we have, oh no, what happened here? Oh, I, okay. This is uh, Elder Bednar, 2014, 
April General Conference bear up their burdens with ease. And he said right here, Today is April 6th. We know by revelation that today is the actual and accurate date of the Savior's birth. So, if there's any doubt in your mind, uh, the church's position on when Christ was actually born, it's April 6th. And it's interesting to note that this is on the Gregorian calendar. This is on the solar calendar, not the lunar or the Hebrew calendar. Um, and I, I and I was kind of thinking about that, about how you know we no longer work off of the the lunar calendar in New Testament times. Well, no, sorry, in Old Testament times. In well, I guess probably in New Testament times too. They were on the the Hebrew calendar, which is a lunar calendar. And I got to thinking about that and how we know that we are currently in a uh, telestial condition, right? It's not the telestial glory. Uh, this is far from the telestial glory. We are living in a telestial condition. And when we move into the millennium, it's going to become a terrestrial condition. Um, I have something here that I pulled up. Okay, this is from Doctrine and Covenants Student Manual. And they quote um, President Joseph Fielding Smith says here, President Joseph Fielding Smith identified the four stages of Earth's existence. Quote, this Earth is passing through four grand degrees or stages. One, the creation and the condition antedating or existing before the fall. That condition was a terrestrial condition, right? That's when the earth had its paradisiacal glory before the fall. Okay, number two, the telestial condition, which has prevailed since the fall of Adam, and that's what we're currently in. Number three, the terrestrial condition, or transfiguration of the earth, uh, that will prevail when the Savior comes and ushers in the millennial era. And then number four, the celestial or final state of the earth, when it has obtained its exaltation. End quote. So why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing it up because I wonder if, you know, and I couldn't find anything to like really explain why the calendars are and were the way that they are and were when or why we went from the Hebrew calendar to now the solar calendar. Um, you know, I, I know that, uh, well, at least I'm pretty sure the Romans were on a solar calendar, and it, it may just be that, you know, the same reason why Christianity split from from uh, Judaism on, like, the Sabbath day, for example. We did it because, well, Christ was uh, resurrected on, uh, on the first day of the week, so now this is the Sabbath, and that's that's it. And, well... Now we're doing this differently because now that we're, um, now that Christ has come, you know, now the, the Gentiles are now welcome into the church uh, or, uh, you know what I mean? When, when Peter had his vision about, um, essentially he had a vision where he was told to eat of these beasts that would have been considered unclean under the Mosaic law. And the Lord said, "Call not unclean what I have ha what I have sanctified." I'm just paraphrasing. And so the point is, a lot of things changed, and I guess maybe the calendar, the original lunar calendar, was done away with. And so now we're on the solar calendar. The the, the Jews are still on the lunar calendar, but what I wonder is, with this concept here, the different conditions that the Earth is going to be in, when you're in a telestial condition which is symbolized uh, by stars, right? You look up to the next condition, which would be the terrestrial condition, and the terrestrial is symbolized by the moon. So maybe it's fitting that when, you, when you're in a telestial condition, you're reckoning your time 
by the next higher up condition. Does that make sense? And since Christ came, when he brought the kingdom with him, like if everything had gone, uh, if, for example, if he had not been rejected and if the kingdom had remained, then the kingdom of God, the, polit the political kingdom would have remained to this day. But that wasn't in the plan. The, sorry, I'm not very good at communicating today. I feel like I feel like I'm just rambling. Hopefully this is making sense. Um, so the kingdom came with him, but it was rejected. But it's going to be uh, ecclesi ecclesiastically, it has been restored with Joseph Smith. But the political kingdom that would have been is going to be implemented when Christ comes again. So, and at that point, we'll be in a terrestrial condition. So, it may be that, okay, let me just, let me just do it this way. Gosh, dang it. Okay, let's look at DNC section 76. This is the part where they're looking at, they're having a vision of the telestial glory. Okay, right here, verse 81. Uh, and again, we saw the glory of the telestial. And then skipping down, verse 86. These are they who receive not his fullness in the eternal world, but of the Holy Spirit through the ministration of the terrestrial. So the telestial glory is ministered f by the terrestrial glory or people. And then it, it states even further in verse 87, and the terrestrial through the ministration of the celestial. So you see, you see what I'm trying to say? It's like in Old Testament times, <clears throat> in in the telesh, the telestial condition, they're reckoning their time based off of a terrestrial body. And then when Christ came, it changed from reckoning our, our time off of a terrestrial body to reckoning our time off of a celestial body. And maybe that's why it's appropriate right now that we no longer observe the lunar calendar. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So probably the right way to look at when Christ was born is now on the solar calendar. Okay, because now our calendar is based on the sun. And so April 6th. And um, so with that in mind, <clears throat> excuse me, um, let's move on now to this. I wanted to bring this up as well. You'll recall, I've shown this on the channel before. Uh, this was given to me by Rabbi Gerfin, and this is how Jews view the year. That the, the different tribes of Israel are associated with a different month of the year. On this uh, diagram, you have the Jewish months, or the Hebrew months, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, so forth. And Nisan, which is associated, it, it usually falls in April, it's either March or April, but typically I think more time than not in April. That's associated with Judah, which is fitting, right? Because <clears throat> we know that Christ, in modern revelation, this is when he was born, in this season. Let's go to the the Hebrew calendar for right now. So uh, let's go to, let's just look at 2023. Okay. Here you have uh, Rosh Kodesh Nisan, which is head of the month or the beginning of Nisan right here. And then you have um, Passover. That's th this yellow right here. Th from here to here, this is Passover. Uh, interestingly, in 2023, April 6th is going to be on the first day of Passover. So may that's another interesting date to look at. But whatever the case, you can see that April 6th <clears throat> is in the season <clears throat> is in the season of Passover. Okay? So Passover, Judah, April 6th, it all matches up. So let's do this exercise. So imagine let's like spread this out this this year that we're looking at here, looking at here from the time that Christ came 
until now. Imagine that you overlaid this year over the last 2,000 years. So Christ came, right? And then we had spring and summer. This would have been like the time of the great apostasy right here. And then the restoration with Ephraim, right? We know that right now we're in that time when Ephraim is gathering uh, Israel. Ephraim is is essentially directing the efforts of the last harvest before winter, right? So Christ came, apostasy, restoration with Ephraim, and Ephraim lines up with Tishri. Tishri is in April 2023. 20, Tishri is right here. Okay, September. Um, so you have Elul first, and then after that you have Tishri that starts with Rosh Hashanah. And so you look at this, and the and the time is short. There's only you know a couple months that you can really harvest, do any harvesting, and then comes winter, and then it's done. There's no more harvesting being done. So um, I feel like this is another reason to maybe look at the solstice as a perfect time symbolically for Christ to come because for this 6,000 year period of being in a telestial condition, that's when it's done. And then we're moving into the millennium, right? There's going to be more harvesting during that time, but because uh, missionary work is going to continue for a time. And then, uh, and then at some point, either the, the older generations will die off that still hold on to whatever, whatever their original religions are, or they'll be converted. So that's what will happen during the millennium, is that eventually everybody will be converted. But as far as the harvest during the 6,000-year period and um, the chance for anyone that's telestial to be saved and to at least become terrestrial before the second coming. Uh, this is the time and this is when it ends. So I just feel like it's all very, very fitting. It makes sense that this is how, um, the Hebrew calendar would have been set up with a, just a big emphasis on harvesting and, um, you know, going throughout through the year uh, which has everything to do with the sun, right? And uh, how warm the earth is and when things can grow and when they can't. So that's why I would propose that, yeah, maybe maybe he would come either on solstice or on Christmas, because you'll remember that back in this article over here, it was talking, where is it? It was talking about how um, on Christmas, that's the day that you can actually you can observe the where it's possible to observe the the sun moving back north right because at solstice it's as far south in the su in the sky as it can possibly get if you're in the northern hemisphere but on the 25th that's when you can observe oh it's starting to return so i don't know uh it's all it's just it's it's fascinating to me i feel like the symbolism is so perfect let's just look at some of this one more time with all that in mind sorry i know this was all kind of like convoluted i don't know how clearly this is coming across um i'm actually not feeling very good today <laughs> that's why i'm doing the video late is because uh we have the flu here in the house it's not coronavirus it's just everyone got sick we slept in and i'm just kind of like blah right now but i hope all this made sense so with all this in mind the the year of the 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 harvest year as you look at the year in terms of harvesting and agriculture as we look at the year in terms of the tribes of israel and how the jews assign the different tribes the different months of the year on the hebrew calendar let's uh take a look at this again so winter solstice why would this be a great day 
It's a day when you have the fewest hours of sunlight in the whole year. So in other words, symbolically, a time when the cup of iniquity is full. And then um, it's the start of winter. Uh, I mentioned before in a video that it's interesting because winter in the northern hemisphere, in not everywhere, but that's when you have snow. And whenever there's just, you know, brand new snow, everything just looks so pure and beautiful. Just fresh snow, undisturbed, uh, which I feel is very fitting for the millennium, right? It just, it's going to be pure. Not completely pure, not like celestial pure, but compared to what we've been going for, through for the last 6,000 years, <laughs> it's going to be pure. Um, okay, it only lasts for a moment, right? Which, which I, that just kind of stands out to me, that with as wicked as the world is getting, you know, once it gets to its most wicked, it's only going to be for a short moment, and then it's done. And this is the time when the Earth, so if it's winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, that's when you're the farthest away from the sun that you could possibly be. And then the sun's path is as low in the sky as it can possibly get, even at its brightest at high noon. And then like President Hinckley said, um... What did he say here? He said, the promise that spring will come again. Okay. The, the promise that the sun will return. The return of the sun. So, and I think, let me just double check. I think that's all I have to say for this one. Yeah, that's all I have to say with this for this one. And then just this again, that uh, if if uh, Christmas, the way that it's currently observed on the 25th, if it was set on the 25th to replace Sol Evictus, then that <clears throat> fits in super well with this whole theme of Christ taking over the Roman Empire, these things from the Roman Empire. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's gonna be it for this one. Uh, sorry if, if if it was just kind of if I wasn't as clear as normal. Not that I'm ever really that clear, I don't think. But um, thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share this, and I'll talk to you guys later.